All right, Patty. So let's talk about the fifth and final mistake that can really erode your culture, which is practicing HR theater. On the one hand, there's policies, procedures, annual performance reviews, pips, et cetera. But on the other hand, there's like perks, parties, risk aversion, lack of accountability. When I left Netflix, I was consulting during another boom. It was the evolution of the happiness officer. There were really people I met who had the job title chief happiness officer, right? That's also your Nev's job on the podcast as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, so come on. Good. You're turning me into a moody asshole right now. Yeah, Nev, he's, he's giving you feedback out of love and respect. Oh, that's, that's really nice. And you can smack him around when I get up. Okay, okay. So I say to this person, what do you do? Like, when you come to work, what do you do? do i mean order t-shirts or whatever mm -hmm. there's three parts of hr when i coach people about when to bring an hr person in which is a common thing for startups ask me about like when is it that you need somebody there's three parts one of them is administrative and compliance it's really really important that's like the payroll people and the laws people the people who they can't sleep because they've spelled your name wrong they dot the i's they cross the t's they're anal retentive and they know all the rules you don't want them to make any of them. You just want them to know them, right? If you get in trouble, this is the lawyer's one. You know, we could be sued. I'm like, okay, how much? What's our liability? If we get sued, who's going to sue us? What's it going to cost us? We could be the first people on earth to be sued. I'm like, okay, again, just let me calculate the ROI just like any other business person, right? And I might go, you know what? I don't think that's going to happen, so I'm going to risk that. Mm -hmm. When I got rid of paid time off, I mean, our lawyers were like, you can't do that. Right. I got rid of tracking paid time off. I didn't get rid of paid time off. But. Right. In a way, that's one of the things, at least at the time, you were most famous for. Oh, yeah. Uh, Netflix was most famous for. And the way in which it was misunderstood was unbelievable. It was. And it was misunderstood at Netflix, too. My successors complained a lot about how they had to fix that mm. later because it became an issue when the demographics turned into lots of people having babies. There wasn't enough structure around it for people to go, hey, by the way, my wife's pregnant. I'll see you in January. Like, whoa, wait, what, what? You said it's unlimited. I can do whatever I want, so see you tomorrow. And so instead of being like, let's be adults here and make some plans and be rational about it. Most labor law in most countries is written to protect employees from evil, bad bosses. That's why they're written. They're not written to screw people and make things horrible. They're written because somebody was exploited or treated wrongly, and so they made a law to make it better. Most of the things that HR people write policy about are not law. Yeah, they're very conservative. Right. They are to keep you from getting sued, to protect the company from the evil employee that might sue you. Mm. So here's what I tell HR people. Go into work. Back in the day when we used to all go into work, stand outside the front door, watch everybody come in and say, they're going to sue me, they're going to sue me, they're going to sue me, they're going to sue. They're not. So it's like we don't need a rule to protect ourselves against the 1%. The 90% of the people have to operate in a certain way because the 1% might screw you. You know why people sue companies? Because they're pissed off. And here's why they're pissed off. They haven't gotten any feedback. Everything's gone perfectly fine. All of a sudden, they're shit. And their boss has, you know, gotten all up to, the boss comes into me in HR and says, you know what, that Patty, I am sick and tired of her. I told her time and time again, she does this one more time and I'm firing her. And I would say, let me go ask her how she thinks she's doing. Well, I, I actually told her nine months ago, like, yeah, right. So she thinks she's fine. So anyway, this happens. The person gets fired. They say, this is not fair. I never got any warning. I always got great reviews. Everything's wonderful. This has to be because it's got to be because I'm a woman because nothing else makes any sense to me. And oh, by the way, when I say what exactly went on here, everybody's like, well, you know, you were, you were, did we, did you, did you, yeah. so here's how you don't get sued. Don't piss them off. Don't blindside them. Don't blindside. Here's my two rules for termination. You could not be surprised and you had to keep your dignity. Yeah. Mm. And so if I was going to blindside somebody and they were going to start hysterically crying, my rules were broken and the person in trouble was not the person that we said goodbye to. Yeah. The person that was in trouble was the person that now somebody's got to teach you how to do that right. So back to your meta question is... My function has gone through a lot of different evolutions, and one of them is to protect you from those evil employees that might sue you. 
One of them is to make everybody gloriously happy, and that'll make everything wonderful. That's the chief happiness officer, because happy employees do better work. You know what happy employees are? Happier. I said to this person I met who was the chief happiness officer, and I said, okay, everybody on the team, come on in. I got an assignment for you. I want each of you to find three people in the organization, doesn't matter what their rank is, who everybody thinks does a great job. Give me three people that you know are people who really have a reputation for contributing to moving the business forward. And ask them, tell me about the time when you felt like you did great work. Tell me about the time when you really felt like you contributed. And every single story will be about something hard. Because you don't go home and tell your pet or your spouse, it was a great day at work today. We all got new t-shirts and we had cookies with macadamia nuts. You go home and go, we did it. This is true, I think, of high-performing people with high-performing teams. And I remember we, we probably could have a whole episode about Travis and the HR mistakes and the narrative and all that sort of stuff. I don't believe in some of that narrative and I'd love to debate and discuss that with you at some time. But one of the things he would say is like, when people would talk about HR or they would talk about perks or they would talk about this or that, he'd be like, the ultimate perk is to work on hard things. And he would also say, if one of your direct reports is complaining about the snacks in the kitchen, you should get fired <laughs> because you're not giving them hard enough problems to work on. I know, you know, when the pandemic happened, I was like, oh my God, how are the software engineers going to have breakfast? And they're going to starve without their cereal. What about a double latte? It's gonna be I worked with people at Google who, when there was a long weekend, they would panic because they had no food in their house. They load up on dinner on Friday night and, oh, and no, waited no, Monday no, morning. No, no, no. The head of HR at Google, Laszlo Bach, Laszlo and I are kind of friends. And Laszlo would be like, they fucking take home stuff for the weekend yeah. for their whole families and their mom and dad. But it was Laszlo's fault, to your, to your point, right? Ultimately. Yeah, right. And we can have a long conversation about Travis because he did a lot of stuff that was really stupid. Mm -hmm. But I think he's right. And I think that... The best perk I think that you can give people is to have other stunning colleagues to work with. That's right. When you feel like you're part of an elite team and that everybody around you could maybe be slightly better than you, then you work. And oh, by the way, you get incredible stuff done that makes you really proud. And so that's why there's a need for some policies and procedures. But I'll give you one last story. It was about dogs at work, right? What's our policy on dogs? Because somebody brought a puppy in and it peed in the kitchen. And another brought, had this like three-legged dog that was just evil incarnate. It was biting people, right? So this is back in the day when I could send an email out to everybody. And I'm like, dogs at work. People are asking me about a policy. If you make me write a policy, it's going to be easy. It's going to say no dogs at work. But let's discuss, right? So for the first 25, 35, 40 emails, it was like, I love dogs at work. You know, when we got rid of dogs at work and excited home, the company went to hell. Dogs are wonderful. Dogs are my companions. Dogs are dogs. Are, da, 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 da. About midnight, one of the executives, a head of products said, I got bit when I was a kid. I am absolutely terrified. And he was like the seven foot tall guy. He's like, I am absolutely petrified. I can hardly breathe. Somebody else said, I'm allergic. And so this one particular meeting, I mean, everybody thinks I'm a space cadet because I have to take my allergy meds before I come in because you bring a dog at work. Somebody else goes, you mean Harvey? Um, Melissa, how come you never said anything? And she said, how come you never asked? And before I was done, my dog policy was written, which was probably not a good idea unless you ask your coworkers if that's okay with them. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, then don't. 